it's Tuesday afternoon, and welcome to Graphic Policy Radio, the comics podcast for folks who don't just care about comics. We're people who care about the well-being of folks inside and outside the comics industry, which is why I ask you to buy your comics from your local comic book shop, especially right now because Amazon workers are on strike and they're demanding to be treated with dignity on the job so they can do things like leave their workstations long enough to go to the bathroom like you're supposed to in a civilized world. Um, if you want to hear more about the actions that folks are taking today, uh, the workers who are on strike, um, check out hashtag Prime Day of Action on Twitter. And, um, you know, I, I understand that it's hard to avoid Amazon forever and ever, but if you can just put off doing your Amazon purchases for the next couple of days, it will really make a difference in showing that we care about how workers are treated and that it's time for Amazon to do right by them. Uh, this is your host, Elon Eleven, a.k.a. Elon of Brooklyn. I'm joined by a really tremendous up-and-coming comics writer to talk about her latest series. So glad she was able to uh, reschedule this with me. It is Teeny Howard. She is a writer and swamp witch from the Carolina Wilds. Currently, she writes Euthanauts, Assassinistas with Gilbert Hernandez. You may remember him from Love and Rockets. Uh, from over at Black Crown Comics which is the new imprint by uh, former Vertigo editor Shelley Bond. Um, she's also writing Hack Slash Resurrection and occasional stories for two of her favorite things, Rick and Morty and WWE. Her previous work <laughs> includes Power Rangers Pink, The Skeptics, put out by Black Mask, which she was on this podcast to talk about maybe a, maybe a year and a half ago. Um, but check out that episode yeah. if you haven't. And a contribution to the secret lives of geek girls. And she's also writing the upcoming Captain America annual, which I'm super excited about as well. Welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me, Alana. I'm excited to be back. (laughs) Yay. Yay. Yeah. I mean, when I found out that you were on the docket for doing a couple of series for black crown, it just felt like a really perfect match for you. Um, you know, I, it's hard for me not to think about Black Crown Comics as kind of being a, a place for like Vertigo 3.0, maybe. Um, and I, I, I strongly suspect that you're someone who came up reading a lot of those uh, Vertigo 1.0 and 2.0 comics yourself. Would, would that be fair to say? I did. I did. I, I was. It's honestly, it's really cool, though, because, you know, like um, IDW over at Black Crown, like I, I, they give Shelly kind of kind of carte blanche you know so it's like it's even a little different from from classic vertigo in the sense that like uh you know vertigo vertigo was a wild place but this is like it's even it's even more that it's like it's like shelly bond 2.0 you know like it's <laughs> it's um it's a lot of her being like okay well these are you know using her like 25 years or whatever in the industry to like uh you know put together the things that she's always wanted to put together and then at the same time like Shelly and I just have a lot of similarities when it comes to like um, aesthetic and the kinds of stories we read and the way we like to see them come across. Uh, So it just, it was kind of perfect. Like um, it was, it was crazy. Like she, I mean, she called me and I obviously knew who she was. So uh, I picked up that phone call and it blew my mind because I had, you know, I'd, um, I'd done the skeptics was my first creator owned series and over at Black Mask and, and Black Mask is a little more like like image uh, from a creative standpoint where they kind of just mm. uh, take their hands off and say, um, here's your space to do a book, do what you want, which uh, was really, really scary for, you know, someone who my prior comics experience to making the skeptics had been doing, um, you know, scripts for books at Top Cow where I had an editor and I had um, help putting it together. So I was still really learning a lot about comics uh, and I ended up being kind of thrown into the deep end with skeptics, which was like a crazy huge learning experience. But I came away from it being like, okay, I, I like, uh, you know, at the point I was at, I was like, I, I need, um, I kind of still need some handholding. I think, you know, it, with the skeptics, it was like, I learned a lot, but in a lot of ways I wasn't ready. Um, and so I remember being like, okay, well, I want to make creator owned books. I want to tell my own stories, but I really wish that someone would like call me on the phone and offer to hold my hand, you know, <laughs> like, someone would reach out and, and walk me through this process because it's a lot, it's a lot of spinning plates. And I, I just needed, I needed an editor, you know, I need, I need help. And I, you know, I had an editor that I hired for um, skeptics, but it was like, you know, I hired her halfway in because I was getting in over my head, having to be uh, both the writer and the, you know, the project manager. Mm-hmm. For the and she was working for you also. Which exactly. Is yeah. Yeah working yeah working for an editor so um you know when I, I remember being just kind of like you know having that like look out the window and wish on a star moment of being like I just wish somebody who I like aesthetically and 
professionally jived with would like call me on the phone and ask me to, to you know, make books with them and, and, and help me tell the stories that I want to tell. And like, lo and behold, Shelly Bond was that person, which was the kind of thing that I, you know, I couldn't even have imagined that it, that it would be her. Like, I, I mean, she's like, I was telling a friend the other day that, you know, I remember when I was reading comics, like uh, there's a thing I think that a lot of people who are like, you know, raised female, um, have happened where when we if we have interests that aren't traditionally quote unquote female we see like another girl name and we like get excited like yeah. when you play like a video game you get excited because <laughs> there's like a girl character I remember like flipping open Sandman books and seeing names like Shelley Bond and Jill Thompson um and being like oh there are girls that work on this book like maybe that's why I like it <laughs> Uh, yeah, and it, yeah, and it's exciting to see Shelley Bond in a position where she has so much freedom and creative power to have like a woman be in that position. Um, yeah, of being it's, the architect for something. And, and yeah, I mean, there aren't a lot of people still working in comics that have her uh, like length and tenacity of career, much less women specifically. Um, mm-hmm. So it's it's really cool to uh, to work with her, and I absolutely came up a big, a big fan of the works that she was curating. Um, and so to be a part of that now and to be, you know, close friends with her, like we, we talk on the phone all the time, you know, we're, we're, I'm excited about seeing her tomorrow in San Diego. <laughs> um, <laughs> Cause we live, you know, we live on opposite coasts and so I don't get to hang out with her all that often. Uh, it, it's, you know, it's, it's cool. It's really, really cool. And it, it, in a very real way, it feels like, it feels like I'm making the right kind of books for me um, mm. that I can work with someone who, shepherds work I really like into the world it's like because I'm I I don't you know I learned doing the skeptics but I'm like I don't I don't I don't want to be the final authority on my own work like I I love collaboration I I you know I came up in fandom writing fan fiction and having beta readers and and having friends draw art and collaborating with people where you know we each write a chapter so like for me it's really important collaboratively and creatively for me to be able to like get on the phone with an editor like Shelly and say, hey, I just need to talk at you for two hours about what this story is about. And at the end of two hours, she's like, cool, I took some notes while you were talking. Here's what this story is actually about, based on what you just told me. You know, like, like you say that it's about this, but when you're talking, you keep bringing up this thematic element. And I think, I think, that, and, and there are so many times where I'll be on the phone with Shelly and I'll say, I don't know what to put in the book. I just feel like, and I'll say what I feel. And she's like, that, put that in the book. <laughs> That's, That's what goes in the book. So we have a really, really great collaborative relationship and um, uh, as an, as an editor and writer, and then, you know, getting to open that up to, to share that relationship with, uh, with artists and, and, and fans is huge and really, really, really cool to me. And, and, you know, uh, I mean, I've gotten to work with so far, I've gotten to work with Gilbert Hernandez on Assassinistas. I'm working with Nick Robles right now on Euthanauts. I got to uh, write a story called, um, Ghost Walk With Me for one of the Black Crown Quarterlies that was illustrated by Philip Bond, who, uh, you know, I've told people before, like, the skeptics would not exist without Kill Your Boyfriend, which was Philip Bond and Grant mm-hmm. Morrison. So mm-hmm. Philip Bond is an all-time favorite of mine. Um, so it's really, really cool. I like it. Like, I like that I get to talk to Shelley and refine my perspective before I share it with an artist who helps refine it further and shares it with me. And we work together to make a great book because I'm not... I'm not the sort of person where I, I come to a project fully formed and I have, I know exactly what I want to tell the artist and I view the artist as like a higher hand. I, I am not like that at all. Um, I'm a, I'm a walking miasma of ideas and I'm just grateful to everyone that helps me <laughs> uh, refine them and, and make them into stories. Oh, wow. Well, you know, following up on your point with respect to coming from the fan fiction community, I mean, how did that involvement prepare you to write comics? Well, I mean, a big thing is that, like, fan fiction, at least when I was working on it, um, you know, it it felt really collaborative. Like, it felt like, okay, I'm going to show this, I'm going to send this to my friend for her to read before I post it online. Or I'm going to post this story, you know, uh, a chapter at a time and see um, what, you know, people think of it and and if it gets you know if if one story that you post maybe gets a lot of attention maybe you work on that one instead of the other one or you know seeing people like I I talked about this on Twitter recently where like uh in the fan fiction community like I felt like the the biggest gift anyone could give you was art like like comments were great shares were great but like the thing that always made me feel like earth-shakingly like my work had done something good was when it inspired someone else to make art 
Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And so like, I like have this huge respect for visual artists as like, you know, they're just like me. They they have a story to tell. They're, they're, they're writers. They just use a different medium. Um, so I don't know. Like I, I, I think, I think that for me being someone who was used to writing collaboratively, because a lot of people feel like an aspiring novelist and it's like, okay, maybe every summer you write, you know, you fill a notebook with stories and you hide it under your bed or something. And then someday you turn them into like novels, but like, I'm not, I'm not a novelist. Like I'm not someone that likes to sit alone for six months and make a story and then, and then show it to the world and have the delusion that it's perfect. Like I love drafts. I love editing. I love notes. I love change. I love refinement. I'm constantly, um, you know, working on stories and improving them. And even if I turn in a first draft of something and and the editor or like the licensor comes back and is like, no notes, I'm like, okay, well I changed Like I, I applied some notes of my own and so here's actually (laughs) the second version. Like, um, I, I, uh, I love that. Like that's important to me. So I think, I think that's an important part of like how for me, it's not like, I mean, one, I guess fan fiction taught me to like playing with other people's toys, which is a part of comics. Um, yeah. Is, yeah. you know, looking at someone else's toys and, and trying to reinvent them in a new way that has meaning to you or might have meaning to someone else. But also because it's collaborative because, um, you know, I embrace that kind of collaboration. That's why I write comics is because I, I don't want to be left alone for, for six months to write a novel. That's, that's not as creatively inspiring to me. Cool. Yeah. No, I think that that makes a lot of sense. I, I'm actually I'm hearing an echo of myself on your computer, so I think maybe oh, your no. computer sound might be on. Yeah. Yeah. Let me, let me test real quick. Okay. I still hear myself. Yeah, I still hear myself. Oh, let me let me test test this real quick. Let me see if I can turn things down. And what about now? Let's find out. I don't hear myself. Woo! We did okay. it. I think my headphones are just like really, really loud. And so sometimes they're loud enough that people can hear it because they're like near the mic. But I think this is good. Okay. This is great. Well, thank you. Um, uh, No, I'm still hearing myself. Um, Okay. Uh, We will, we will move forward and hopefully our listeners will not. Sir, I turned you way down. Let me test real quick. Okay. Thank you, listeners. I you may have noticed I, I recently have had a better microphone, so hopefully that's improved quality. I don't hear myself. Woo, okay. okay, we did it. Excellent success. All right. Um, so thank you, thank you for sharing that with us. It feels like talking about the connections between fan fiction and comics writing is something that there's a chunk of comics people who are really eager to discuss this, and there's a chunk of comics people who are like la la la, I can't hear you, la la la. So it's always interesting sure. to hear from the side of folks who are, you know, like interested in talking about that as part of their creative process and development. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think there was a time where I was really embarrassed about it. Um, And then I think it was like when secret loves of geek girls came out is when, (laughs) or is when like I wrote my piece for that about how my first serious relationship was with a, a girl I wrote fan fiction with and how that like in really funny ways kind of informed our and also kind of you know less funny ways kind of informed our like young stupid love uh so once that happened and I was on panels and I had people coming up to my table to say hey I read your piece and it really excited me to see like a a published writer talking about their like emotional entanglement with fan fiction that like you know, I realized that I was like, this was a really important part of my creative development. And I, I was, I felt really rewarded for sharing it with people. And, you know, and, and in this day and age, it's like, you know, if, you know, people can get hired for doing amazing fan art and people like, and, you know, you see like, you see creators like talking about how like, oh, well, here's this letter from when I was a little boy and I wrote to Marvel and I said, I wanted to write Spider-Man and now I'm writing Spider-Man. Like, that's really cool. But I don't have that experience because I didn't feel like I could go into comic shops when I was eight years old. Yeah. So I don't have that experience. So my version of that experience is, is fan fiction is, is I, I never believed like I can grow up and write these characters. I didn't have anyone telling me that I believed that I could write fan fiction about them while I thought of my own stuff. Um, so, you know, for me, fan fiction is, is that experience is being, it, that is my ability to say, you know, I thought I could do this one day and I did. Uh, and, you know, That's I don't, awesome. I don't like, I don't share my, it's lost to the four winds. I don't share my fan fiction anymore. I, 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 because, you know, it could be, 
Um, and I don't, you know, and I, I, I don't like read fan fiction for uh, comic properties or anything because it's like that whole danger of like, you know, I don't want anyone to think that, um, you know, I just translated some story and sold it to someone. Or something. And I just, I, I, I don't, I, I don't um, like make fan fiction anymore, mostly because writing is my job. So it's not relaxing to me to do it for fun anymore. Yeah, uh, sure, sure. I mean, it, it, it is and it, it can be, but in, in, in different ways, you know. But I, I think it is important to to be like, hey, you know, the ways we engage with fandom are important and special and deserve to be talked about, even if they, I mean, I, I can't deny that I think that there is an aspect of the way that people shame things like fan fiction, um, specifically because they are largely female, <laughs> like, um, they're largely written by women. Yeah. So. I, I think that's a big part of why uh, there's a lot of like derision towards it. You know, it's like, oh, well, mm-hmm. you know, w- wanting to write Spider-Man and sending Marvel a letter about how you're, you're about your Spider-Man story is, is cool and admirable. But if you're a girl who wrote fan fiction about Spider-Man and having like a romantic relationship, that's, that's not cool. You know, and I, I, I think that's BS and I'm just happy to help tear that down. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. It's it's not a topic that we've really talked about as much on this show. Uh, and I think our audience is like primarily dudes. So it really means a lot to me to have someone sort of break it down and explain to them that perspective. I mean, honestly, for me, like my investment is largely like this is, yeah, this is another example of sexism and we should call it out everywhere we see it. So, so yeah. 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 yeah I, and it's just, yeah. you know, it's, it's a way that like, even when we're holding women up, we sometimes look negatively towards pursuits or things that, um, might primarily be enjoyed by women. You know, it's the it's the same way you see like you know, um, dads getting cheered because they put on a dress or wore makeup. It's like to to support their daughter. It's like so brave. It's like is it like you know, liking female stuff should be cool. <laughs> like women are cool. Totally, the things we totally. like are cool. <laughs> And you know what's also frequently a female interest and was also sort of developed by women as a genre itself is horror. Which I do yeah. want to come back to some of the things from your own work. I mean, horror is definitely a significant theme. Um, like, what was your connection with that coming up? So, I mean, I'm a, one of the things I always tell people is like, I'm an October baby. My birthday is a week before Halloween. So, I, I grew up with like a really big affinity for uh, like horror and Halloween and, and anything that kind of had the trappings of that. Um, like it just, it was, I don't know, it was around my birthday. My dad is kind of a, a, a cynical, gloomy guy. You know, I was a big part of it is like, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm white. Like I, you know, we, I don't, I I didn't have a whole lot of problem find problems finding other, you know, white women in, in media. And that's, that's something I'm aware of. But at the same time, it was like, I was a really like pale skinny kid with black hair who liked spooky stuff. So, like, mm-hmm. as much as I loved Barbie, I didn't really feel like there were a lot of Barbies for me. But, like, I would watch the Beetlejuice cartoon and be like, Lydia, Lydia's me. <laughs> like, yeah. It's sort of this, it's like, you know, representation even in, in, in some silly ways and in, in ways like just showing people that have different interests is important. Like, that was a really important, you know, and like Wednesday in the Addams Family movies. Like, I loved her because, you know, Christina Ricci was cool. She was in Casper and <laughs> she mm-hmm. got to be Wednesday. And, um, you know, that, that, that was a big part of it, uh, you know, when, even when I was too young for, like, real horror. Um, and then as I grew up, you know, I just kind of, uh, being aesthetically tied to those kind of things, like, found myself, oh, like, oh, I like, you know, I like Tim Burton. Um, but then also I like, you know, and I started reading Anne Rice. I've always been a voracious reader. I read a lot of nonfiction. I would read a lot of ghost stories and true crime and uh, paranormal what if kind of books. Like I read all those like Eric Von Daniken, what if it were aliens, chariots of the gods books when I was like really young. Um, so I got really into specifically horror and sci-fi. Mm. And, like, and I love Star Wars too. So when I found out that there was also like sci-fi horror, like there was like horror in space, like that really got, got me going. Um, <laughs> and then, yeah. And then, and then it wasn't until I was older that I kind of blinked and realized, wow. Um, a lot of these horror things that I, I really like uh, actually have girls at the head of them. And now, you know, we, we look at everything from, you know, slasher films with things like, you know, uh, classic movies like Halloween in which Laurie Strode is the smartest person in the room and Texas Chainsaw Massacre, where we see, you know, a, a moment of like just raw 
female survival at the end to modern stuff like the Babadook, which is about uh, motherhood, really, and the witch, which is about, uh, you know, sexual maturity and, and patriarchy and, and uh, it follows, which arguably is about uh, promiscuity and the way it affects men and women differently as teens. Like, yeah, um, these movies that are like really, really like art house feminist horror that appeal to a mass audience. Um, that's just very much my jam. <laughs> that's like all of my buttons mm. right there. Uh, so, I mean, you know, I write horror now. I wrote, uh, I write Hackslash Resurrection. I wrote um, a story for This Nightmare Kills Fascist called Devil Daddy. I wrote Magdalena. Um, I, I, you know, I love horror and a big part of it for me, like uh, Devil Daddy, the story I did for This Nightmare Kills Fascist is about um, a witch who sleeps with the devil at the crossroads and ends up pregnant um, and is turned away out of Planned Parenthood. So she goes back to the crossroads to confront the devil herself. Oh, um, Wow. Yeah, so the, to me, it's like those kind of existing is a fabulous thing. Like, yeah, <laughs> like yeah. I mean, it's it's you know, it's um. Or she was sorry. She's, she's turned away by like a clinic, you know, because she's in like a okay. rural area where there's right. where there's one clinic and uh, they're only allowed to be open on you know one Friday a month and you have to have an appointment and you have to have these papers and you have to have reliable transport. Like the 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 whole like, part of the horror true. of the story. Yeah, yeah. Like the, the horror, horror of the story is Carolina. real. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. The, the horror of the story is, is, you know, a really real experience. And, you know, if you're um, and, and for me, the kind of core of it was like, what if you're this woman who is underprivileged in a lot of ways? You know, you don't have reliable transport, you reliable money, reliable support, but you need this thing that should be a service, a medical service that you're able to access. Um, but you do have power in other ways because you are a woman of, you know, a, 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 of a certain age and there's sort of a... Um, you know, there's a there's a long storied history in horror going back to, you know, Rosemary's Baby and even before that of the idea that the patriarchy is freaked out by birth and <laughs> and, and, mm-hmm. and women powered it to, to do it and feel it. Um, so so what, what, uh, what's the name of that story? That sounds amazing. It's called Devil Daddy. It's by Christian Dabari, who's the same artist on Magdalena. And uh, it's in a book called This Nightmare Kills Fascist, which was kickstarted. And now I think you can get it from Wave Blue World, which is a, a publisher, the like smaller press publisher. Hmm. But there's a lot of great stories in that. Justin Jordan has a story in that that's like, like Eat the Rich. It's like pretty cool. There's like Eric Pelicki, uh, Matt Miner, a lot of great oh, cool. sort of indie comic folks uh, are in that book. Um, and it's kind of a like a leftist horror anthology where we're all kind of, uh, you know, we're all kind of left leaning and we're feeling some frustration with um, uh, political, the political landscape. And we wanted to kind of creatively uh, get that out of our systems with an unabashedly political horror book. So it was a lot Love of fun. it. That sounds fabulous. Thank you for sharing that. I'm definitely going to check that out. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a great yeah. book. There's a lot of great, great people in it. Now, t- tell me a little bit about you got st- how you got started with youth and arts. With that, what's the core concept there, and what and what folks should be looking for? It's it's on the shelves starting tomorrow, right? Tomorrow, yeah. Um, so the I've always wanted to do a book about death that felt like me because I'm obsessed with it. Um, I'm, I'm a very morbid girl, and uh, I think. When I can go back to like thinking about euthanauts and wanting to make it a thing, uh, I, I really, I kind of have to go back to the death of David Bowie. Um, you know, like a lot of people, I was like up at 4 a.m. watching videos from, you know, watching the the Lazarus and video that had been released. And that's, it was like four o'clock in the morning on the East Coast when it came across Twitter that yeah. he had died. Um, and I was like, shocked because it became immediately clear that his final album release had been on purpose and it immediately mm-hmm. recontextualized all of this art immediately you know Lazarus and, and Bla- the entirety of Black Star was a goodbye um, it was a, a deliberate look into into death and what was coming and him saying okay well you know if I'm gonna die what can I do with it um, and it felt like he did he did something with his death and not in a sacrificial way but in a, in a, in a way of like well you know Almost like, you know, you're like, well, I have to go out to get eggs. I might as well get, you know, shoes while I'm out. Like, it's like, he was like, if I'm going to die, I might as well do something with it. Um, yeah. And it was really, 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 really powerful to me to see someone 
aggressively and deliberately and artistically contextualize their own death by making art that planned for it. That blew my mind. Um, and so from there, I, I got really into the idea of like, what do you, how can, this almost like pharaohic way of like, you know, I don't like the idea of living for death in like the, you know, what's essentially like the, 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 the tradition of many religions of afterlife, right? Like mm-hmm. be good here because you need to go to the good place later. Like, I don't, I don't love that. Um, but I did love the idea of living as preparation um, and preparing for something like that's really scary and unwelcoming. And so I got the idea that, okay, well, what if death is a, is a place and most people don't stick around there because they just can't hack it. The, I remember the metaphor I used to kind of sell Shelly Bond on it was I was like, um, imagine trying to go to space in a hot air balloon. Like you'd get pretty high, but once you reach the atmosphere, you'd, you'd, you'd freeze, you'd run out of breath, you burn up, like whatever, like you just wouldn't get there. And most people just don't get there, but you and are people that do, you know, they go there and for lack of a better word, they can spacewalk. Um, they can use their, their ego and their will um, and their acceptance and contextualization of death to go there and, and perhaps discover it and see what's there and find a way to share it with the world beyond or with the world back here, you know? So our main character, Talia is, uh, she's like a tether. She's a tether between someone who has died and someone who is living or someone who has died in the world that is living um, in kind of a, a forced recruitment way that we see in the first issue. Um, and a lot of Talia is, a lot of her contains those things that to me are reasons why death is so compelling. Um, a big part of the book is Talia's experience with disassociation and mental illness um, and the idea of protecting oneself in the way that when she goes to death, she has to protect herself with a suit. A lot of us feel like, you know, we have to protect ourselves in a crowd. We have to disassociate. We have to make barriers between ourselves and the rest of the world. Um, because sometimes those barriers are what define us. So, uh, yeah, so it gets, it gets pretty trippy. <laughs> it's, um, it's kind of my thesis statement on, on how we live and how we die. Um, so I hope I get to keep working on it for a long time. Oh, wow. So I, the, um, the uh, astronaut helmet that she, d- that she develops definitely takes on a new light, given the context of thinking about it with Bowie's death and the uh, Black Star video. Yeah, yeah, there is um there is there is a lot of of Bowie love in the DNA of the book, which is another reason why doing it with Shelley is great, is because uh she's not someone who's ever gonna tell you to put less of your love of Bowie into a book. Um <laughs> but yeah, I mean the the um the first several issues are like uh ground control, lift off ignition, they're references to space oddity. Um you know, there is a there's a reason that our main character um, in at one time you'll see her and her her pupils are weird. Her eyes look different. And that's that's another Bowie nod. Like for me, oh, it's, totally. it's part of the it's part of the DNA of it. You know, it's like it's not just Bowie stuff. It's my fascinating. It's it's my love of of the things that have made me love the things that have made me love death and fear and, and love life as well. You know, the things that have made me fascinated with the fact that we die and treasure the fact that we live those, that art is all in the DNA of Ethan. It's, it's part of why it exists. That sounds wonderful. Yeah. I really enjoyed reading the first issue and um, I actually wasn't familiar with, I don't, I don't know that I was familiar with the artist's work before, but um, the character design stuff really stood out to me. And, and also just like seeing things like seeing fat people in comics is always exciting, especially when they are just part of the landscape. Like in yeah, real life. Uh, <laughs> Nick is an absolute genius. Um, he's done work for Vault with Alien Bounty Hunter. I was so, so happy that we could get him for this book. Um he, the story I tell everyone about him that how Black Crown kind of discovered him was he did fan art for Kid Lebowski, which was the first Black Crown book. And Tess Fowler saw it, I think because they're both big critical role fans. I think that's maybe how they knew each other. Um, they did like 
to do art for them. Um, Tess saw Nick's kid lobotomy fan art and was basically like, can I give up my cover to make this, to have Nick do a cover? Cause Nick just does the character so well. And that's like the essence of working with Nick is like you, Nick will just do something because he's just naturally brilliant and good and giving. And it's like, all you can do is just to get out of the way and let him work. Like all you, like every time I see him do anything, I just want to pack up and move and be like, take it, go nuts. Like he's, He's so, so good. He is absolutely a co-creator and a co-storyteller of this world in every way. Euthanauts is as much his as it is as mine. Um, he, there are, I mean, not just in the art and the visual storytelling, there are lines in the book. There are names of, of um, like titles for things. There are, uh, I mean, it, the, the Indigo himself, the, the redheaded guy that everyone's fallen in love with already from the book, um, he, he himself, is such a figure in the book because of how much Nick responded to him and Mm. how much, and and I couldn't look at how much Nick responded to that character and not think, you know what, there are going to be a lot of people like you and what he has to say is something that you feel connected to. And I can't ignore that. So yeah, Nick is absolutely the, the, you know, the co-host of this world um, in the same way that, that I am. And his character design is really incredible to me. And because, um, it was important to me to have characters that uh, that we you know we don't always see terminally ill characters, and also I yeah it was really important to me that that um, that Talia was someone who um, just wasn't like I, I remember when I you know when I described her to Nick early on I was like look this is you know we're we're free here from the tethers of having to make uh, quote unquote realistic superheroes you know the way people often come back with the the athleticism argument as though there aren't athletic people of all shapes and sizes yeah um, guys check out the sports illustrated uh, body yeah. issue if you doubt people's ability to be super strong and not skinny right um but also it's like talia is not physically gifted in really any way nor does she have the interest in developing that and i didn't want to make her another real thin character who never works out like I'm not (laughs) I I work out maybe once a week and I ain't real thin like um it was important to me that she had um thickness and gravity that she took up space in the world of the living um I think one of my favorite details is that in that that front cover where we see Talia's skeleton um her skeleton seems like it would be her skeleton like she has like a large rib cage because she's like built um she's a fat character she's uh someone and it's just part of her you know and, it, and it, that was something that you know I, I mentioned that it was important to me and then when I saw Nick's um designs for her it was just he got it she's so lovingly rendered um you know there are moments in which he draws her in you know a funeral dress and it and it pulls across her chest in the same way I feel dresses that don't fit me pull across mine you know I it she goes to the beach. She does, you know, she's, she's not, um, she just exists and that's okay. Like, you know, no one's, it's not a book where people are telling her to like lose weight or where she's crying about, you know, feeling sad or fat or whatever. Like, it's just not her. It's just not where she is. And she's, she's real and she exists and um, she's stylish. Uh, she like, you know, even though she yeah. can't focus on a lot of things, it's like, she still has a sense of personal style. Like, and it was just, it was, it was really important to me. I was really glad that I was working with an artist who, when I said, um, you know, Hey, it's important to me that this character is not the same idealized woman that we see dressed differently in, in a lot of comics that uh, Nick really delivered and delivered lovingly. And, and he, her, her body is always rendered with such uh, care and thought and, and realism to it. It's super important to me. I mean, and I was also just reflecting all that in terms of the characters in the different crowd scenes, you know, like it's not like it's a it's a one off thing. Like you're, you're you're depicting a diverse world. Yeah, I mean, that's that that first um, crowd scene we see of Indy at his party, um, you know, was or at the at the wake, you know, at the funeral was, was really exciting to me because it was like, yeah, I mean, these were. Um, I remember the direction they gave us. I was like, these are you know, these are these are pagans. These are radical fairies. These are these are. Um, a weird, colorful, wild, diverse group of people. And I don't want it to look like Coachella. Uh, and, and it didn't. And I loved it. I love that. I love that all over the book, there are old people, there are sick people, there are fat people, there are people of different colors. There are people who could probably wear each other's clothes, but their bodies don't look the same. Like 
there are, and then outside of that, when we go into places where the laws of the real world don't apply, um, Nick is so, so good at figuring out the most beautiful way to blow our minds. Wow. Thank you. I mean, yeah, like those opening pages of the, uh, the, the funeral and the wake were just so striking and really, really sold the comic for me as well as the covers. The covers are freaking cool too. <laughs> the covers are great. Yeah. And it was, it was hard because it's like that first page. It's like, I'm, I'm depicting a dead woman, like, you know, a, a dead naked woman on page one. Um, and, le- um, I mean that character, it's not, it's not a secret. It's not a reveal. It's just, it's not super important at that time, but that character Indigo, one of Indigo's mothers who has died, that character is trans. Um, and I'm not trying to like JK Rowling it. It doesn't, sh- it, 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 it's a fact about her. It, it comes up, it, it doesn't come up in any story way. It's not a reveal. It's just a fact about her. Um, but I was like, I remember telling a, a good friend of mine who, who is a trans woman, I was like, I'm, I, I'm really nervous. I, I realized that I wrote a dead naked trans woman on page one. <laughs> and she gave me this look like, are you crazy? And I was like, I, I feel like, I feel like we can do it though. Like it's not, you know, she's not a murder victim. She's not a blue body being fished. She's someone's mother. She's loved. And she just happens to be the character. That's where the story happens to start is she dies and her son is at her funeral. And he's the one that, you know, he's a witch. He's the one that's, you know, guiding her body and, and, and guiding her journey. And this is, they're, they're witches. This is part of their family. This is part of their family um, story is, is for him to do this for her. And I, I was really, really pleased because I, I, what Nick delivered is not, is not what you usually think of when you think of a dead naked woman on page one, you know, um, it's, it's loving and, 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 and it's what I wanted, um, it's not lurid. It's not uh, exploitative. I felt like it was, it was a page about love because so many of us, I mean, realistically, most of us haven't spent a lot of time with the dead and especially not dead that we loved. It's not really common culturally for us to spend time with those we love after we die, but it's arguably, it's arguably an important part of the grief process. So it was something yeah, that I thought that, yeah. yeah, I mean, it was something that I thought was like, how can we show people how much this book loves death? And this book is not about skeletons jumping out of your closet to scare you. It's about the love and the acceptance of death. And it's like, well, on page one, we have someone showing a dead body love. That was important to me. Were Are, are there like specific things that you've been um like reading in terms of creative influences and how you were approaching death in the story? Oh yeah. Um, all of Caitlin Dowdy's books. Uh, she's, if you're familiar with her YouTube series, ask a mortician. She runs a really cool kind of alt funeral parlor called undertaking LA. And she has a YouTube channel and she's an author. Um, and she kind of talks about death all over the world. Um, I read that. I read confessions of a funeral director, which is by Caleb, uh, can't remember his last name right now, but he, I, I read every, every like pop funeral directing book that you can get at Barnes and Noble, you know, <laughs> like, or your, or your local indie bookstore. Um, I went and, and kind of cleared the shelves on those and uh, read a lot. And I read, um, and then I read some books that were less entertaining and educational and books that were more um, like functionally educational. I read a book called Final Exit, which is about, um, which, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll pause and, and, and say that this conversation might get into a little a, a frank discussions of death. So if, you know, if, if, if you're someone through whom can't listen to that right now, that's totally fine. Um, uh, Final Exit, which is a book about people who are terminally ill and seek euthanasia. It was written by a man in the 70s after his wife was terminally ill and he was he became really involved in the right to die movement um, after his wife um, wanted to handle her own uh, exit and wanted to die with dignity before um, a terminal disease uh, put her in a situation she did not want to be in. Um, and so after he experienced that and, and experienced a lot of difficulty and, and medical pushback from doctors who he was trying to get to help him with his wife and her, what, what she wanted, uh, he wrote a book called Final Exit, which is an educational manual for those who are um, advocates for the right to die movement and, and euthanasia. So I read that, which was that book. I, I read a lot of similar books, which were very, very hard reads, but very good. I, I read a lot about... Um, 
care. And uh, one of the things we do in the back of every issue, um, in the print issues, uh, and there's one, you know, in the back of tomorrow's issue, uh, we do backup material called Death Sentences. Um, in the age of Twitter, we kind of found out with Assassinistas that as much as we like doing letter pages, not a lot of people send in letters because uh, people just kind of tweet at me or they ask me at cons if they have questions yeah. about the book, you know, people don't really send letters anymore. So I said, you know, I, I, I was thinking of books I love like Sex Criminals and Bitch Planet and how those books used their their um, backup material to do really cool things. I really liked how Bitch Planet would talk to luminary feminists and, and sex uh, criminals would talk to you. Um, sex professionals or have people tell their sex stories. And I was like, you know, let's do something similar. So we, we do backup material called death sentences in the end of every issue of euthanauts and every issue of euthanauts, we talk to a death professional. So uh, in issue one, we talk to someone who works in an OR and, and um, often their job involves uh, transporting the dead in a hospital. Um, so we spoke to that person about what it's like to, you know, go into work every day and, and face death. Um, you know, on a day-to-day basis. Uh, We um, talk in the second issue, we talk to an estate planning lawyer about uh, wills and inheritances. Um, Oh, that's so important. Yeah, because I realized, you know, I was like, I want to use, I was like, one of the things I want to use this space for is telling people how to write their will and how to set up their estate. I realized I had done nothing for mine. I had no clue. And I really wasn't a good person to educate people about this. So, which is kind of what the idea for death sentences which is instead of me doing research and talking at people about things I don't know let's see if some professionals will talk to me and we'll just print my conversations with the professionals and like listeners Um, like real talk like I don't care that you're not rich if you have relate when you die somebody is going to be dealing with what you own and what to do with it and if you've not made it clear what you want you are making it harder for your family like please (laughs) Please remember that. A, a big realization for me was that, you know, like a lot of artists, I, uh, I don't have a lot financially and estate wise, but I realized like, oh my God, I have so many contracts with things I've created that are mine that I own. And if I die, who owns those things? Like, you know, people want to make a movie of my work after I'm gone. I want, I want my family and my loved ones to benefit from that. And I don't have any way to guarantee that, you know, and it was like this wake up call for me. So, uh, yeah, I realized, you know, the best thing we could do was just talk to professionals and, um, you know, and I, I don't know if we'll be reprinting that uh, in the trade or not. So I really, it's also hmm. a good way to encourage people to pick up the single issues because um, I, I don't know if the death sentences are going to make it into the trade, but I want people to read it because we, some great professionals took time out of their day to talk to me and to educate us about everything from what it's like when you die in a hospital to what happens to your stuff after you're gone to, uh you know, how embalming is done to how headstones are designed. We're talking to people from all over the death industry. And I don't know if they'll be reprinted again. So if you need a motivation to go to your local comic shop and uh, or order from a, a shop online, a lot of really cool indie shops online do online orders. If you're someone that's staying away from Amazon, but you're still not near a local shop, um, places like Thanks. Midtown will will absolutely file online orders for you and you can get the single issues and you can check it out and you can hopefully learn a little something from our death sentences in the back. That's fabulous. Um, And also just to point up here also like communicate with people about how you want to be buried or not buried or what kind of funeral you want. Like do it in advance. Do not leave it up to your surviving relatives to guess because it will make them more stressful and miserable. It will make them like we're, we're not psychic. You know, yeah, and that's you know that's part of what we address in in euthanasia. You know, it's a book about death. People die in the book, um, <laughs> and we see you know people having to deal with grief with with how we grieve differently when a death is expected versus when it's unexpected. Um, how no matter how in order you think you have things, your family will, uh, you know, your 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 family is gonna have to do work <laughs> after you're gone to, to set things up you know and, and the work that we do for the dead and about the dead and around the dead and um the different ways in which we process losing um loved ones you know that's that's all stuff we see in in the book that 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 you know that that pain of what death is like in the real world is something we try to put there so that it doesn't seem like we're just taking off into death space and zooming around in rocket ships you know Otherwise, death mm-hmm. has no meaning. But to be clear to our listeners, there is like real sci-fi 
bizarre, non, not of this earth and not things you've seen before, you know, images oh, in yeah. the comic, not just, yeah. <laughs> Lots of it. And it, it is, they only get wilder as they go on and um, people's lines blur and um, we start to, you know, we, we, we start to, you know, Talia kind of inherits a job and inherits a world and we kind of watch her um, try to deal with that inheritance. And, and as, as it becomes stressful and as the pieces start to ravel, you know, either wrap up or unravel. Um, yeah. I mean, I absolutely, I'm not going to waste a talent like Nick Robles on just filling out will paperwork for 20 pages. <laughs> Um, right. there are a couple, there are a couple issues that we, you know, you get a couple extra pages because we were just like, I can't force Nick to draw this beautiful image of the panel because I know if I give him a page, you know, he's going to, he's going to go crazy and, and blow all of our minds. And he does, you know, there's a lot of, um, full on, uh, sci-fi weirdness. You know, one of the, one of the things I've talked about is like when I was a kid, I really associated that kind of blackness of space with death in like a, a weird way, like, and the idea of having to survive without like the right tools and knowing mm. the procedures was important to me. So like, uh, like, a, like Apollo 13 was always my favorite space movie growing up because it was like, you're in space, actual factual space, and you have to fix it with duct tape. Like, <laughs> that's what you want. <laughs> and if you don't I'm get scared. home safely, then yeah, then you're out here. And there is no... Yeah. There is no down. It's not even like if you, you know, if you jump out of a plane, you know, you'll hit the ground. Like there's no down out here. There's no up. There's no anything. And to me, like that, um, that void just attached itself irrevocably to the, the, the kind of blackness of someday I won't exist of death. Um, mm-hmm. Like scared me enough to light a fire under my ass. I wrote a book about it. <laughs> Well, I want to make sure we have time to talk about two other things, which is Assassinistas and also your work on Captain America. So I'm going to pivot a little bit hard right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, So Assassinistas is a super cool comic. Um, I I just love the – I love that you're teaming up with Gil Hernandez because it's like this intergenerational indie comic now as a result. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, it really, really felt like – I, I, you know, I've mentioned before that I was like, I loved the concept and I loved the characters, but I was, I have, I was having a really hard time seeing them until Shelly suggested uh, Gilbert Hernandez, at which point I was like, well, if he says no, we're doomed because like, that's what I need now for this book. That's how I see it. Right. Um, and it just, it made it, I, I think a lot of artists would have made Assassinistas into exactly what it wasn't, which is um, it, w- it is not a hyper-violent book about girls kicking ass. Um, I wanted it to not be that. Um, I love a lot of action and, and, and uh, you know, I love a lot of, like, I love, you know, some of the obvious things that people compare it to, like Kill Bill. You know, I, like, I love those things. Um, but to me, you know, an and homage is really only worth it if the people doing the homage have a perspective. Yeah. <laughs> and new to so, yeah. It was really clear to us that we were like, well, we need to bring in, it was cool that Beto and I are generational and that, you know, Shelly and I know we are generational. Like Shelly started reading comics because of love and rockets. So um, hmm. it was like a really, a really kind of wild generational thing to do in a book that is so generational and is like, okay, so yes, you know, you stop thinking about these cool girls when they win the mission and you turn the movie off. Um, but what if they still exist? What if they're fully realized people? Um, and so it was like With children and families and like being middle aged. Yeah, aged. and that idea of like you know what they what they touch has to be around them and has to whether they, whether they want it to want it to affect it or not. You know those things are touched by them. The, even the things that they sometimes have tried to abandon um, are touched by them, and they can't avoid that. Um, which is thematically similar to euthanasia. I have a thing, but. <laughs> Uh, Mm -hmm. but, but yeah, you know, for me, that was just, that was really, um, an important part of it was to, to make it clear. And I think, you know, having Gilbert made that clearer than anything I could have said to anyone is that, you know, this isn't, this isn't, uh, Kill Bill part three, you know, this is, um, this is us. This is a story that forces us to remember that, uh, strong female characters are all, are, are, are real, theoretically real people. Um, when we're done, you know, 
using them to, to cheer at and to, to cheer for their violence. Like that violence affects yeah. people. Those women affect yeah. people. Um, I think my favorite thing anyone said about it was when Jeremy Whitley said it was like unforgiven for Charlie's angels. That's like <laughs> specifically because unforgiven is like a really violent story that condemns violence. And I was like, yep, that's, that's a lot of what, that's a lot in the DNA of assassinations, you know, is a, a, a violent story that at its core, like, is not super pro violence, but it's the same way, but at the, they were at the same time. It's like, but if the things that force us to, ha- or the things that cause us to have familial bonds and pull us out of our own heads, if those things are inherently violent and bad, then what, um, how do we respond to them then? So, yeah, I mean, it, you know, you have, this is a story about a mom who is a retired assassin and her former partners and some of her moms, some it's unclear. And, um, you know where they are, where they are in their lives now. What's their relationship to their children? Uh, how do they keep them from getting into peanut butter and sugar that may or may not be dangerous for them? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, like the, uh, the 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 don't feed me, I have allergies shirt is like I've like I have friends who have like kids who have severe food allergies, and like Shelly is even like, oh my god, when Spencer, her son was a baby, he was allergic to everything. Um, but I was like, I like the idea that someone who literally used to put herself in the way of gunfire would be like, but my child is so important that I'm like afraid if someone feeds him peanut butter, it will kill him because it can kill him. And I love him so much. And I've been through so much violence and I need to like preserve this like beautiful life I've made in like a bubble. You know? And like, yeah, was, you know, it was like a, it was definitely like social commentary to make the mom of the group that does that, like the, the like white upper, upper middle class mom, you know, to show that like they all kind of chose to live their lives in different ways. And, and the fact that like the white upper middle class of the moms is like, you know, able to bubble her son in that way. But at the same time, like she has legitimate reasons for wanting to bubble her son in that way. <laughs> like peanut butter yeah. just isn't the danger to his life. And she doesn't know that. <laughs> yeah. Peanut butter can kill certain people not the rest of us but definitely exactly does they, if you exactly. have that allergy and think, yeah and like if, if someone you love and some a life that you've created is is so important to you that you won't see anything harm it but it's in really real danger from maybe getting kidnapped but you've sworn off that life what can you protect him from how can you you know um express those urges and you know if you are a mom who wants to be scared of stuff happening to your kid, there is no shortage of things to be scared of. Yeah. Uh, um, and, you know, one of those ways that manifests for Charlotte is a paranoia about food allergies. It's not meant to be derisive or mocking towards people that actually have food allergies. And as far as I know, I don't think anyone's read it that way. And if they have, no, definitely very not. Sorry. But yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's not meant to be derisive and mocking towards food allergies. It's more to the, the point that it's like, if you, that sense of like, I can't protect you from everything. So what can I protect you from? Because this is more about my anxiety than your safety. <laughs> like, yeah, I mean, it's a metaphor coming. that's also real, like in how people believe, how people act, right? Mm-hmm. It's absolutely true. Like, you know, you see a lot of people who worry about what video games their kids play, but they don't worry or take action against people that would allow, you know, automatic weapons to fall into people's hands easier. Ding, ding, ding. Yeah. (laughs) So I love Blood Diamond's helmet. (laughs) I I love Blood Diamond's helmet a great deal. Um, Is that a Hernandez invention or did you guys do that together or? That is a Hernandez invention. Um, All of the, Blood Diamond I thought had the most amazing design. Um, I really like, I've had a couple of people say they want a cosplayer and I'm like really hoping it happens. (laughs) Yeah. Well, all the designs were um, taken from specific visual, like, touch points that influenced the genre that, like, I wanted to reference. So I kind of, like, gave, for each one, I kind of gave Beto, like, um, like little nods. So, like, Octavia was if Pam Greer played Deathstroke, um, which is still a movie I would so watch. So true. So <laughs> true. <laughs> Octavia was if Pam Greer played Deathstroke, um, Blood Diamond, well, Charlotte was, uh, she was supposed to be like, um, like Sharon Tate meets like, uh, like, like Motoko Kusanagi style sniper. Um, but she was, so she was supposed to have like, uh, you know, like the sniper rifle and the kind of militaristic gear, but then also like the, the, 
beret, the tennis skirt. Like she had, uh, Sharon Tate, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Patty Hearst. Patty Hearst, yeah, yeah. Uh, not Sharon Tate, uh, Patty Hearst. She was supposed to be like the Patty Hearst, like uh, SLA, you know, infamous photo of her with the, the automatic rifle and the, the beret, like that mixed with like, um, like a uh, like a Ghost in the Shell style sniper, like a militaristic, or like a Sonya Blade style, you know, like some like the militaristic chick with the like, you know, heiress, the like the SL, the the, mm-hmm. the all American tennis player girl, and yeah. then um, Blood Diamond was basically like uh, I kind of wanted a girl, like a female femmed up version of like Deadpool meets Genji, <laughs> like. I was like, she is like pure assassin. Like she, you know, of, of all of them, she needs to le- look the least like she could, uh, you know, go, go normie, like go, mm. uh, go straight, you know, cause she's the least, she's the least likely to, um, she's like the, the, she, her, her outfit, I wanted to look the most like a costume and, and better like, yeah, you know, I, I love that blood diamond. Oh, the one thing was, I was like, I wanted to have like a letter jacket that says blood diamond, like over her, like Deadpool costume. <laughs> and <laughs> he like gives us that shot. And I was like, man, one of these days I'm going to make myself that jacket. <laughs> yeah, no, everybody, you guys should go cosplay these characters, folks. Definitely. I feel like all of these characters are infinitely cosplayable and also amazing. Like, and I'm a former them- cosplayer. So there is, there is no honor there's no honor like having someone cosplay something you invented. That's, that's the greatest honor there is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now, speaking of things that are a great honor, I'm so excited when you were named to be doing the Captain America annual. Thank you. Um, I'm a, so, I'm excited how, that too. how did that come together? I'm really excited. Well, um, let's see. I've been, I've been talking to Marvel on and off about me doing something for them. I'd pitched something before that, didn't get picked up, but I've been so busy that I wasn't really like, you know, aggressively reaching out to them. I was just, you know, I, I wanted to work with them, but I've been really busy. And um, uh, Alana Smith uh, over in the Captain America office reached out to me and she was like, hey, you know, um, I really like the skeptics. You clearly have, a, a, you know, a knack for historical period pieces and character pieces. And, and I have this, you know, kind of Cap and Bucky 40s period piece that we want to do. Um, do. Do you want it? Do you want to do it? And I, I was like, absolutely. I love, I love Cap. <laughs> um, so I was really, really happy to do that. And I don't want to say too much about it because I, I, I want people to to read it, enjoy it. But I had, I had 30 pages, um, which is a lot for like your first Marvel. Yeah. 30 pages. It'd be like, don't screw it up. Um, so I had, I had 30 pages to uh, tell a story that it was, um, you know, hard because I, I mean, you know, people have read the solicits. It's it's about Cap and Bucky um, trying to protect some camp escapees. Um, so it was really important to me because I'm like, I don't want to tell a story where Cap and Bucky roll up and save the day. I don't want to tell stories about trauma and pain that isn't my own. I don't want to tell stories that are uh, ignoring the history of what happened. But I, I got to tell a story about two characters I love very much connecting with some very uh, brave and cool people and uh, standing up against um, forces that would not let them live. Um, and I feel like it was important to do right now. It, it, it was yeah. really, really cool for me to, you know, kind of at this moment in time, look back on, on what Captain America originally stood for and uh, to be able to be, a, to be the voice of that was something I'm very proud of and was very honored to get to do. And, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm, as, as the grandchild of Holocaust survivors, like, I, I really have a good feeling about this. And I don't say that Thank about you. a lot of Holocaust-related popular culture materials. So, Thank you. Um, that means a lot. Yeah. I, I, that means a lot. I, um, I, I, you know, I, I, I talked a little bit about it on, on Twitter, but, you know, I, uh, one of the things that was important to me was I, I have uh, Romani ancestry. Um, and I, you know, it's not it's not something that I, you know, culturally have grown up with. So it's not something I feel comfortable speaking on, but uh, I did get to, I, I did want to give one of the characters, um, you know, rum a background because that, you know, those were for people who were absolutely yeah. persecuted uh, by Nazis and Holocaust. Um, and so I was able to give that character my ancestor's last name, oh, uh, wow. which was cool. Like it was really cool for me to get to put my own personal history in, um, in something that I've loved for such a long time, 
uh, like, you know, the Marvel Universe and Captain America and yeah. to put her in there as, you know, a, as a survivor and as someone that gets to, to kick ass alongside Cap and Bucky, you know, in her own way, rather, you know, I, I, cause it's not, it's not like a story where it's like, okay, here's some guns, ignore everything bad that happened to you, but um, it's a survival story. So you've got savvy people kicking ass in their own way. And uh, to get to give her my last or my ancestor's last name and to have her exist in that world was like really important to me. It, it felt like, it felt it felt really cool, <laughs> so I'm I'm glad I made you feel good about it. Having the um, having the support of of people uh, you know who are who are really tied to that moment in history is very important to me. So thank you for that. Well, I mean that's really beautiful. Thank you. I, when 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 is that going to be out on the stands? September. 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 Oh, very soon. Very soon. Okay. Yeah. Very soon. cool. So for folks who have been hungry for a historically grounded Captain America and Bucky story, we, we've got that coming right up, right up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think you guys will enjoy it. Um, I'm a big fan of like Band of Brothers, <laughs> and that was kind of like a big like touch point. And Alana, you know, and, and Marvel, her and I both were like, yeah, we love like Band of Brothers and Saving Private Ryan. We <laughs> love you know war movies. I love war movies. Um, so for us, it was like we had a really, really clear vision for it and what we wanted it to feel like. And uh, we were, I was like, yeah, you know, I, I want it to feel like a, like an episode of Band of Brothers starring Captain America and Bucky as they do, um, as they do work that we don't always see them doing, which is right. um, not just fighting for people, but also protecting people, fighting with people, fighting behind people sometimes when it's their turn to, to step back and let other voices be heard. That's, that's important to me. And I think, I think it's a really good, uh, it'll be fitting in right, you know, with Ta-Nehisi Coates' run. It's, it's, you know, not tied in story-wise because his run takes place in the present day and my run takes place in the forties, but it's, I think it's something that fans of, of his run um, hopefully will enjoy. Well, thank you. And thank you for joining us. Um, let our listeners know where can we find you on the internet? Uh, most of the time, like a lot of comics, I'm on Twitter and I'm Teeny Howard. So T-I-N-I Howard, like the duck, all one word. Um, you can mm-hmm. find me there. I have a website, teenyhoward.com. I have a Facebook fan page if you follow me there. But um, yeah, Twitter is really the best way. And uh, if you're at San Diego Comic Con this weekend, I'll be doing some signings there. So you can come say hi to me there. <laughs> oh, that's great. That's great. Definitely check out your Check out Teeny at, at San Diego Comic Con. I will not yeah. be there, but there's amazing people. So, if, for folks who will be, they can actually get uh, Euthanauts number one at the IDW booth. They can also get early copies of the Assassinistas trade paperback. Ooh, so, yeah, that'll be out. We are, about, we are about that time. We are about that time in the history of Assassinistas. Yeah, I think it hits shops like in a week or two, but well, IDW has some for sale for for Assassinistas fans. The booth. <laughs> cool, cool. Well, thank you again, and I, I hope you'll uh, be able to join us again sometime in the future. You're doing so many cool projects, and um, thank you. We eventually, I hope we'll have to speak out about DC goth scene '90s things in a way that. Oh will my gosh! Yeah, we didn't even get to that yeah. Sunday though. No, Man, wow. it's okay. Well, <laughs> we will make it. <laughs> like, did I meet you clubbing? Possibly, possibly. Maybe. <laughs> it's entirely possible. Like, uh, match up our timelines, like Sherlock Holmes style. Indeed. Well, thank you, Teeny. Have a great week. Thank you, Alana. Thanks for having me. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so for our listeners, uh, thanks for bearing with us. This was a take two of an episode we tried to do last night, and it, we had technical difficulties on my end. Um, the good news is not only did you get to hear from Teeny Howard, but we've got another episode of Graphic Policy Radio coming up tomorrow night where I will be covering Ant-Man and the Wasp alongside with one of my frequent political uh, and pop culture collaborators, Felicia Perez from the Center for Story-Based Strategy. If you guys were part of Black Panther Fan Activist Con, you got to see her work there. Um, and Felicia and I are super excited to talk about Ant-Man and the Wasp tomorrow. That'll be at 9 p.m. Eastern. Talk to you then. If you're coming into this episode late, uh, you can always get the rest of it at graphicpolicyradio.com. We're on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Stitcher, um, always at Graphic Policy. And if you're looking to reach me, I'm on Twitter all the goddamn time at E-L-A-N-A underscore Brooklyn. That's E-L-A-N-A underscore Brooklyn. Hit me up with your questions, thoughts, and comments, especially if you've got things you want to say about Ant-Man um, in the next couple of days before we actually tape our coverage on that. So uh, thanks again, and keep it geeky. And also don't buy anything from Amazon right now.
Hey, thanks for watching the previous video from Graphic Policy Television. Just by watching, you help support our site. Thank you so much. Now, if you're watching these videos, you probably care about geeky things like movies, television, comic books, toys, games, video games, you name it. You can go and subscribe right now to our YouTube channel to stay in touch and catch all the new videos, or check out our website at graphicpolicy.com. There's a nice link on this end of the video. But as always, thank you for watching. Keep on rocking and keep it geeky.